احمد وبس احمد بليز ان ميوت يور سيلف ان ستارت يور كام بليز Yeah, sorry about that. Yeah. So once again, thank you for uh, the kind invitation. Uh, there will be some overlap between my talk and Dr. Asherm talk because I'm, I will focus here on immunotherapy for esophageal and gastric malignancies. Uh, I thought it might be a good opportunity for those who are not able to attend the elegant talk of Dr. Asherm uh, that I might go over some of these uh, like clinical trials and to try to streamline the immunotherapy pathway in oesophageal and gastric malignancies. Also, I would like to thank BMS actually uh, for letting me have this talk on their uh, behalf. Uh, so we know that, uh, you know, uh, gastric uh, cancer is not among uh, the most common cancers in, in, in Saudi Arabia. Uh, actually, uh, the incidence <clears throat> according to Globocon is around 5.7% uh, with expected mortality of 8.2% among different kinds of cancer. This underscore the poor prognosis of this cancer entity in comparison to many other types of cancers. Uh, even the previously uh, known poor prognostic cancer like lung cancer, because now we have so many options and treatment and immunotherapies and targetable uh, like targetable uh, mutations. Uh, the lung cancer prognosis now started to be much better than uh, gastric cancer. So this is why we are focusing now on immunotherapy, hoping to have much more options to extend the survival of these poor prognostic uh, cancer entity. In Saudi Arabia, according to the Saudi Cancer Registry, you can see that uh, like 2016, like almost 78 male patients with 50 female patients have been diagnosed this that year with oesophageal cancer and almost 207 uh, with 111 females have been diagnosed to have gastric cancer in 2016. As you can see that the natural history, the median overall survival of advanced gastroesophageal cancer is generally less than 12 months. The standard of care is a platinum fafifu based chemotherapy as a first line agent. Subsequent chemotherapies include aromaticane, Taxanes, TAS-102, plus minus ramosurumab, of course, with Taxane, represent the standard of care in subsequent lines of treatment. The question now, where, where is the role of immunotherapy? Where do immunotherapy options uh, fit into the treatment paradigm for patients with advanced gastroesophageal cancer? To know the answer to this question, you have to consider the molecular testing, including the HER2, including the, the, the MSI or MMR uh, deficiency uh, testing, uh, BDL1, uh, and of course, uh, the tumor mutational burden now, especially more than 10, is being considered an agonistic indication for uh, like uh, immune checkpoint inhibitor like pimperolizumab. So to have a clear idea what to do next, with your patient, you in gastric cancer patient, you have to have these molecular biomarkers available to decide what to do next. Uh, there have been uh, like FDA approval for several types of immunotherapies in gastroesophageal cancer. So namely, we have in gastric cancer, the pimperolizumab have been approved in later lines uh, of treatment for BDL1 uh, more than one, CPS more than one. Uh, like in third line and beyond. In oesophageal cancer, uh, the PEMPRO was also approved in squamous cell carcinoma for BDL1 of CPS more than 10, again in second line setting, while nivolumab in, in oesophageal cancer have been approved in squamous cell carcinoma in the second line, uh, regardless of BDL1 expression. And this is what we, we are talking about, the tumor agonistic indication, okay, which means regardless of the type of, of, of cancer we are talking about, if you have an MSI high uh, cancer, you may consider like using pimperolizumab and later lines of treatment if you don't have a good option to offer. And now they added also the uh, tumor mutational burden high as defined by 10 and more mutations 
okay, it, the PIMPRO can be used for the same indication in later lines if you don't have better options. So let's focus on the different clinical trials in gastric and gastroesophageal adenocarcinoma. I'll start with the third line setting because this is where the PIMPRO and nivolumab have been introduced in the business of gastric and esophageal adenocarcinomas. And one of the oldest uh, studies is actually the Keynote 059. Again, this is the third line and beyond, third line and beyond. It was a single arm study where overall response rate was the primary endpoint, and it was reported to be 11.6% for single arm uh, and single agent pimprolizumab. Okay, in, in this study, they looked into BDL1 positivity, like CPS more than one, they found there is a clear difference that the benefit was mostly restricted for PDL1 positive. And of course, the earlier the line, like third versus later lines of treatment, also they derive more benefit with regard to overall response rate. If they combine both together, PDL1 and third line, the response rate, as you can see, was even more humongous. Look here when they consider MSI high. Can you see that? It's 57%. Again, this is a third line pimprolizumab uh, in heavily pretreated gastric and esophageal cancer. And this underscores the MSI as a prime predictor for response to immune checkpoint inhibitors. So you have to consider doing this test. I know that the chances is somewhere between three to 4%. However, it's really a strong predictor to benefit of pimprolizumab. Okay. This is the progression-free survival and overall survival. This is the comparison between PDL1 positive and PDL1 negative. Again, the same trial of PIMPRO, single agent in third line setting. And as you can see, most of benefit is restricted to PDL1 positive patients. So as a conclusion of that, of this study, if you want to use PIMPRO as a single agent in later lines, third line and more, it's either to be MSI high, and this would be the best patient candidate the second scenario to have it as a BDL1 positive uh, patient. Uh, when I say BDL1, I mean CPS of uh, one or more, as clearly uh, indicated in this table. Okay, then we'll come to the attraction to study. Attraction to study is using it's an Asian study, uh, so it was mostly done in the Asian countries, uh, Japan, South Korea. Uh, uh, so, so, so didn't include like other like kind of races or ethnicities in this uh, kind of study. However, it was like nivolumab in third line setting, nivolumab versus uh, placebo in gastric and gastroesophageal adenocarcinoma, regardless of BDL1. So they didn't require BDL1 testing here, and you can see the difference was almost one month with regard to median overall survival. It was statistically significant with a hazard ratio of 0.63. And the same for progression-free survival. It was like a very small trivial kind of difference. However, it was statistically difference, like significant with a hazard ratio of 0.6, as you can see, and a significant p-value of 0 0.0001. So it's statistically significant. The mean difference is small. However, it's an option in a third line setting for patients who don't have other kind of options regardless of BDL1 uh, expression. This is for nivolumab and gastroesophageal adenocarcinoma. So if I want to summarize the immunotherapy rule in the third line setting, we have nivolumab, the attraction to regardless of BDL1 expression, we have an improvement in overall survival an improvement in progression-free survival against placebo. Uh, on the other hand, we have single arm study, pimprolizumab, the keynote 059, has improved the overall response rate, progression-free survival, and overall survival only in BDL1 positive, CPS more than one, and of course, MSI high uh, tumors. What about the second line? The second line, we have one study only, which is the Keynote 061, comparing second line pimprozumab to second line paclitaxel in those patients who failed first line platinum 5FU combination. So what they found, and the primary endpoint here was overall survival, and the progression-free survival was uh, another like uh, co-primary endpoint. As you can see, this is in CPS of one or more, 
you can see that the, at the beginning, Paclitaxel was bitter, but after roughly like eight to nine months, there was a flip in the curve where Pimpro uh, did better. However, this kind of survival advantage it didn't tr translate into a statistically significant kind of difference. The progression-free survival, as you can see, there is no difference whatsoever. This is in CPS of one or more. But there was a post hoc analysis, subgroup analysis, when they consider those who have CPS of 10 or more. Look at the hazard ratio now, it's 0.64. So it seems to be much more significant. And again, in the subgroup who have MSI high tumors, you can see the hazard ratio is 0.42. So in the second line setting, despite you know the trial with its primary endpoint was negative, so it didn't reach its statistical significance with regard to overall survival. However, if we consider those patients with CPS of 10 or more, and those who have MSI high uh, gastric cancer, those are the patients who might drive most of the benefit of having PIMPRO in the second line setting. So if I have a patient in the second line setting and I had a BDL1 positive 10 or more or MSI high more strongly, MSI high gastric cancer, I may myself, uh, I may consider pimperuzumab in these patients. What about the first line setting? Now, once again, we are talking about gastric cancer first line setting. There have been another keynote study, which is the Keynote 062, and this was a th three arm studies using PIMPRO alone, chemo alone, or PIMPRO plus chemotherapy. And they tried to find the endpoints in CPS of one or more and CPS of 10 or more. Okay, what they found there that in the CPS of one or more, the PIMPRO alone, uh, the PIMPRO plus chemo was not better than chemo alone. Okay, so the combination of PIMPRO and chemo was not better than chemo alone. So it's an extra cost and probably some extra toxicity with no added benefit. However, on the other hand, they found that PIMPRO alone was not inferior to chemotherapy alone, as you can see by the reflected by the hazard ratio over there. Okay, but when you consider the CPS of 10 or more, the story is different. You can see that PIMPRO alone is superior to chemotherapy alone. This is with regard to the uh, overall uh, survival or the survival advantage. And this is a slide which, show, which can show you the impact of MSI high uh, as a, predictor fa a predicting factor to benefit to pimperolizumab. And this is from the keynote 061, the pimperolizumab in the second line setting. And this is from keynote 062, the pimperolizumab in the first line setting. And in both, whether first line or second line, if you have an MSI high gastric adenocarcinoma, this is a strong predictor to the benefit of PIMPRO over chemotherapy. So if you have a patient who have MSI high gastric cancer, don't miss the chance to start immunotherapy in this patient. And now we'll come to the landmark study, the Checkmate 649 which was actually presented at this ISMO 2020, uh, like almost, uh, I would say six months ago. And it was again a, a three arm study, nivolumab plus ibilumumab, or nivolumab plus chemotherapy. The chemotherapy here were Zilox or Fulfox, or chemotherapy alone, Zilox uh, or Fulfox. Okay, the patient had been randomized. So what I'm presenting now is the comparison between chemotherapy alone versus chemotherapy plus nivolumab. The dose of nivolumab, if you consider every three weeks with, uh, with Xilox, it's gonna be 360 milligram every three weeks. Uh, for every two weeks, it's 240 milligram with uh, full fox. The primary endpoint, it's a dual primary endpoints, overall survival and progression-free survival in BDL1 positive as defined by CPS of five or more. Okay, as you can see, that median age was around 62 to 63, 70% of those were uh, male patients. You can see 25 were Asian, 75% were non-Asian, and this is the uh, primary tumor location where 70% roughly of this population were truly gastric cancer. The rest 
uh, you can see that uh, like almost 12 to 13 percent were esophageal adenocarcinoma. So it did include some esophageal cancer here. Uh, and you can see that only 4% of those patients, three to 4% were MSI high uh, gastric cancers. Okay, this is the first uh, primary endpoint. As you can see, the overall survival, there was a clear and clinically meaningful improvement in uh, uh, overall survival by almost three to three and a half months from 11.1 to 14.4 months with a significant hazard ratio 0.71 and a significant p-value of 0.0001. So this is a clear benefit and significance of adding nivolumab to the first line chemotherapy, whether Xilox or uh, Folfox. Uh, when we look at uh, a different level of BDL1 positivity of CPS of one or more, or all patients, whether BDL1 positive or negative, once again, we can see that nivolumab also has significantly improved overall survival in these populations, whether talking about BDL1 of CPS1 or more, or talking about BDL1 positive and negative population, still the p-value is significant, which means that nivolumab has improved the overall survival regardless of BDL1 uh, positivity. As you can see, uh, the, the, the improvement in overall survival was seen in all subgroups, with no exception, even those patients who are microsatellite stable, you can see they still drive significant benefit by adding nivolumab to first line chemotherapy. What about progression free survival? The same kind of story like overall survival, there was a clear benefit from addition of nivolumab to first line chemotherapy with a significant hazard ratio and p value, has improved from six months to 7.7 .7 months. The same kind of finding even if we change the CPS from five to one or more, and even if we consider all BDL1 positive, BDL1 negative population, you can see that the hazard ratio is still significant, which means that nivolumab has improved the outcome regardless of uh, BDL1 positivity. You can see the duration of response was also in favor of nivolumab in the first line setting. The overall response rate was has improved from 45% by chemo alone to 60% by nivolumab uh, plus uh, chemotherapy. The toxicities uh, were not, yani the nivolumab was not, it didn't add that much of toxicity and the same kind of toxicity profile that's well known to nivolumab from previous clinical trials and previous clinical experience that we have in other tumor sites. So as a summary, okay, so the addition of nivolumab to first line chemotherapy, Folfox or Xilox in gastric adenocarcinomas, gastric or esophageal adenocarcinoma. Uh, the primary point was overall survival and progression-free survival in PDL1 positive defined by CPS of five or more has significantly improved. Even this kind of improvement was seen for BDL1 of CPS one and more, and also for all population, whether BDL1 positive and BDL1 negative, as such, the investigators have concluded that NIVO plus chemo represent a new potential standard first-line treatment for patients with advanced gastric cancer, and I do actually concur with that. So this is this kind of combination, NIVO plus chemotherapy in the first-line setting, I believe it, be, it will be like a standard of care in the near future. Another study in the first-line setting is the attraction uh, for a uh, study which is uh, which use a combination of first line nivolumab plus uh, chemotherapy. The chemotherapy here was uh, uh, like S1 plus oxaliplatin or uh, or Kpox. Once again, there have been two primary endpoints: the overall survival and uh, progression free survival. The progression free survival has met its primary endpoint, which means there was an improvement in progression free survival. However, uh, we didn't the overall survival uh, didn't show significant difference. And uh, for some of the reasons that Dr. Ashar mentioned, pro, yani maybe because of the uh, percentage of PDL1 positive population in this study, and maybe because of the chemotherapy backbone using S1. So we don't know why do we see this kind of difference. But for me, if I'm gonna use uh, like nivolumab in the first line setting, I might use the approach of the Checkmate 649, which is a combination of nivolumab plus Folfox or nivolumab plus uh, Kpox or Xilox. So 
further data uh, using Avilumab. Avilumab have been tested in two different studies. One of them, the Javelin Gastric 100. Uh, after giving patient chemotherapy, they have tested uh, the maintenance uh, uh, Avilumab versus chemotherapy. As you can see from this curve, Avilumab was not uh, like superior to chemotherapy as a maintenance strategy. And also Avilumab have been tested in, as a third line uh, treatment uh, in front of chemotherapy. Once again, there is no survival advantage. So as a bottom line, Avilumab as of today, it doesn't have any rule in gastric cancer management because most uh, like both the studies came back negative talking about maintenance in first line or in the third line setting. So if I want to summarize immunotherapy in the first line setting in gastric cancer, we have the keynote 062, where there was an overall survival benefit in PIMPRO, uh, whether talking about CPS more than 10 or overall survival benefit in MSI high, uh, like gastric cancers. If we are talking about CPS of one or more, the PIMPRO as a sole agent was not inferior to chemotherapy. So is not superior, but was not inferior. But the Checkmate uh, 649 is another study which showed overall survival, progression-free survival and response rate benefit by adding nivolumab to chemotherapy in the first line setting. And this was true whether talking about PDL1 positive using different kind of definition, CPS of five or more, CPS of one or more, or even if we consider the whole population, PDL1 positive, PDL1 negative, addition of nivolumab to chemotherapy, I mean Fulfox or Zilox, it that did translate into improvement in overall survival, progression-free survival, and response rate. The Javelin Gastric uh, 100 uh, failed to show a benefit of abilumab in front of chemotherapy. So this has summarized all immunotherapies in gastric cancer uh, studies. What about esophageal cancers? Esophageal cancer, esophageal cancer is a little bit different from histological point of view, from molecular profiling point of view. And this is why we have different studies than gastric cancer. One of the studies is the Keynote 180 using pimprolozumab as a single agent in later lines of treatment like, uh, like um, uh, third line and beyond. And as we can see, the response rate has improved significantly only in squamous cell carcinoma and only who have been tested uh, BDL1 positive CPS uh, of 10 and more, score 10 and more, okay? Then we had the landmark uh, keynote 181, which is a phase three trial testing pimperolizumab in the second line setting versus uh, chemotherapy. And once again, if we look at the overall survival in the intention to treat uh, population, uh, there was a trend of improvement, however, was not significant. But if we look into the squamous cell uh, carcinoma histology, you can see the p-value was significant in favor of pimperolizumab. And the same for PDL1 positive, like CPS of 10 and more, there was also a significant improvement. So once again, if I am going to use pimperolizumab in esophageal uh, cancers, I will restrict it to squamous cell carcinoma and CPS of 10 or more. And this is where the FDA approval of pimperolizumab in esophageal cancer came. Squamous cell carcinoma, CPS 10 or more. This is pimpro in uh, esophageal cancer in the second line setting. Then we have the attraction three, attraction three study, which is a second line nivolumab versus uh, chemotherapy in uh, esophageal squamous cell carcinoma. And as you can see, this is a pure uh, suffigious squamous cell carcinoma. So it doesn't have adenocarcinoma in the population. And as you can see that uh, the, the, the nivolumab was superior to chemotherapy with a significant hazard ratio of 0.77, uh, which met its primary endpoint. And also, if you look at the, uh, this is the overall survival, I'm sorry. The progression-free survival, uh, it doesn't differ as does the overall response rate. So this is another uh, like kind of option in the second line in esophageal cancer, nivolumab, regardless of BDL1 positivity in esophageal squamous cell carcinoma. So both of them, the PIMPRO and NIVO can be used in the second line in esophageal squamous cell carcinoma. Nivolumab can work in squamous cell carcinoma without need of BDL1 testing 
while PIMPRO, if you're going to use it in the second line for suffusion squamous cell carcinoma, you have to do uh, BDL1, and the score has to be of CPS of 10 and more. And the keynote 590, this is a first line. This is not a second line. This is a first line. Pimperolizumab plus chemotherapy versus chemotherapy alone in esophageal uh, cancer. And as you can see, that the median overall survival has improved by adding Pimpro plus chemotherapy. Uh, this is for all patients. So 12.4 months versus 9.8 months. And if you consider like CPS of one, uh, you can see that the, the median survival will be better. If you consider uh, uh, like a squamous cell carcinoma, also the benefit would be even better. So this is another kind of combination that you can use in the first line setting for uh, osteophageal carcinoma. So if I want to summarize the use of immunotherapy in osteophageal cancers, we have the keynote uh, 181, and this has established the rule of pimperolizumab in the second line setting, only in osteophageal squamous cell carcinoma and BDL1 positive using the score of CPS of 10 or more. And we have also the attraction three study, the second line nivolumab in osophageous squamous cell carcinoma, regardless of PDL1. So the only difference between this trial keynote and attraction three, that PIMPRO, you have to do PDL1 test. In nivolumab, you don't have to do PDL1 test to treat osophageous squamous cell carcinoma in the second line setting. And then we have the keynote uh, 590. This has established the first line PIMPROZUMA plus chemo. Uh, uh, like uh, where there was a benefit in intention to treat population BDL1 positive and squamous cell uh, histology. Uh, so this is all for the advanced osophageal cancer. Uh, there is one landmark study which was also presented at the ESMO uh, this uh, year, uh, 2020, the Checkmate 577. For those patients with osophageal cancer, whether squamous cell or adenocarcinoma who have been treated with concurrent chemo radiation followed by surgery. If those patients, they still have residual cancer in the primary tumor or nodal disease, they have been randomized to either nivolumab or placebo, and the total treatment duration will be one year, one year of adjuvant uh, like nivolumab. The primary endpoint was disease-free survival, secondary endpoints were including overall survival. The patient population were you know, equally distributed between the two. This is the primary endpoint, which is disease-free survival. As you can see, nivolumab significantly improved the disease-free survival in comparison to placebo. You can see that uh, the, the uh, disease-free survival was 11 months in placebo arm, where it was 22.4 months in nivolumab, so almost doubling of disease-free survival. The HAS ratio was 0.69 with a p-value of 0 0.0003. So it was statistically significant. And this kind of benefit was seen in all subgroups favoring nivolumab, adjuvant nivolumab, post-concurrent chemo radiation, post-surgery in those patients who have residual cancer at the primary tumor or nodal disease. Again, once again, the safety uh, profile of nivolumab is well known to most of us and nothing or no alarming kind of toxicity that have been raised in this study. And there have been uh, like quality of life, uh, like kind of analysis was presented at the GI ASCO like almost two months ago. And you can see there is no difference whatsoever between the placebo and nivolumab. And the patient reported outcome analysis revealed similar overall health status between nivolumab and placebo, which indicates that nivolumab was not toxic to those patients to the extent that, you know, there was no difference in the quality of life between nivolumab and placebo. So the, the, the uh, um, investigator uh, concluded that this kind of nivolumab, adjuvant nivolumab may represent uh, a new treatment strategy for osophageal cancer who have been treated with concurrent chemo radiation and surgery, and they still have residual cancer. Nivo adjuvant nivolumab treatment might represent uh, a new promising strategy to reduce the risk of recurrence. So with that, I may conclude my talk about the use of different immunotherapies uh, in 
gastric cancers, uh, different lines, third line, second line, and first line. And also I talked about the esophageal cancer, whether talking later lines and first line. And finally, I concluded with the use of nivolumab in the adjuvant setting. And I would conclude here. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ahmed, for this nice uh, comprehensive uh, review about use of immunotherapy in uh, gastroesophageal uh, cancer. For the sake of the time, we can get one question if uh, any one of the panelists here has any question. If not, I will just ask one question, uh, Dr. Ahmed. Uh, now sure. regarding the uh, the testing of PDL1 in the metastatic setting. Also, we have one question from the audience regarding this. So there are different, you know, scoring system that we are using in the uh, in the testing of PDL1. So do you think with the result of the checkmate 649, do we really need to uh, spend a lot of time doing PDL1 testing, or we can just use nivolumab as a part in addition to chemotherapy? This is this is an excellent question. I was expecting actually a question like that. And to be honest with you. Uh, despite the study showed that nivolumab uh, plus chemotherapy was beneficial regardless of PDL1 uh, testing, uh, but for me, I'll stick to the primary endpoint of the study, which is uh, trying to get, uh, I mean, uh, the uh, CPS of five or more and to treat those patients with this kind of combination. Uh, if this kind of like kind of testing is not available for whatever reason, uh, like uh, for me, I may consider. Uh, combining nivolumab plus chemotherapy. But if I have this kind of uh, testing available, I will stick to the primary endpoint that have been mentioned in the study. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ahmed, for uh, your presentation again. And now we'll move to uh, our uh, next uh, speaker, uh, Dr. Kanan uh, al uh, he's a consultant GI oncologist and phase one clinical trial in National Guard Hospital uh, Riyadh. Uh, and he is going to talk uh, to us about the uh, ramosromab in uh, hepatocellular carcinoma. Uh, this is a satellite symposium for uh, Lily. Uh, so thank you. I firstly thank the organizers and I thank uh, Eli Lilly for uh, 